The goldfish cracker is the snack that smiles back. Weighing in at 3 calories and 3 centimeters tall, they've become a food icon. However, in the past 20-ish years, there's actually been a major overarching story right under our noses. So join me today as we uncover what this world has actually been hiding. Hi everybody, I'm here in my kitchen. My parents said I can't cook for my life, so here I am with some oven mitts, too many knives, and a dream. So goldfish crackers have actually been a thing since about 1958, but today I want to specifically look at the most popular portion of the goldfish cracker universe, that being the decently long-running series Finn and Friends, the commercial animations that would end up making a story that's simultaneously as ambitious as it is a little bit lazy and dumb and stupid in that order. In 2001, in some suburban home somewhere in the connected 48 United States of America, there was a family who at minimum consists of members including an unnamed mom and daughter, a boy named Jamie, a bloodhound, a lizard, a cat, and an entire society of fish crackers just flopping around. From 2001 to 2004, there would be the Goldfish Crackers Stone Age. The Goldfish Crackers at this time aren't dignified. They're more goldfish than they are food crackers, though that would change as time would continue. Traits of these older goldfish included lower intelligence, size manipulation, and being able to swim in the air regardless of size. Then, in 2005, late into the night, Jamie, that lovable scamp from before, sneaks into his kitchen and takes all the goldfish crackers he can find of all different flavors, but specifically a classic bag and a color bag. Jamie goes back to his room and then begins to eat them all in the dark on his bed, dropping a good amount of them under his bed, and this moment alone would quickly erupt into an actual functioning society in their golden age. For some reason, this family just loves their fish snacks. Like, they have multiple bags of every flavor, and justifiably so. Goldfish crackers are famous for being the only snack that smiles back. Unless you're a cannibal, then it's one of two. Yet because of this, the fish had to fight for their lives against this honestly intense, yet most likely nuclear family. Somewhere around this situation, in 2005, natural selection time. This is Finn. He's our protagonist, our main guy, the bread in our friendship sandwich. He's a good dude without an attitude, and he's incredibly nice to everyone. 2005 also marks season 1, because the Goldfish Crackers fanbase and animators cared enough to make each respective arc as a season. So there's 8 arcs, 8 seasons, 1 season per arc, it's simple enough to comprehend. Throughout 2005, Finn's warning all of his fish pals, Hey guys, maybe we shouldn't be eaten. Maybe we should have a Goldfish Cracker protection program. Maybe we should have a buddy system. Maybe we don't walk into the Flavor Blaster, designed specifically to Flavor Blast Goldfish Crackers that's also in this house for some reason. At this point, you can also tell which goldfish are more intelligent based on the development of their eyeballs. And in this case, all the ones without retinas and stuff are killed off, leaving Finn's bag almost entirely empty. This is when he has his first and only moment of character development in the entire series, where he realizes these aren't his people, and dying and stuff isn't really his thing, so he kind of just stops trying to save the bag, which is good because there's like six fish alive, so it's a little bit too late to keep trying. 2006, Season 2. The New World Arc. Everything we just talked about was the build-up to the actual series. If Season 1 was the introduction, this is more like the exposition and what to expect for the rest of the series. Finn tells his brother Walter in his only ever appearance that he's gonna dip and find out what he truly wants in life. Walter goes, alright sweetiekins, stay safe. And then he does that, surviving a massive fall off the nightstand and immediately meets the next two friends of our group, Rook and Gilbert. Rook is the girl fish. You can tell because she has eyelashes and she's a smart, strong, independent fish. Imagine Finn but parmesan and gilbert gilbert sucks dude he is awful he's this little dingus who's so lame all the time always complaining always getting into these wacky yet ungoofy predicaments like he unironically did like the mcu type dialogue where he says awkward in a major emotional confrontation He's ruining things, he's awful. He's not doing any justice to his flavor, which tastes pretty good in queso, I'd recommend that. But that's besides the point. There's only five established characters in within the first two seasons, and Gilbert's my eighth favorite. In the friendship sandwich, he's the cement. After those two, you got Extreme, who gets introduced right after them. He's flavor blasted, but actually survived the flavor blasting of 2005. And his name is just his personality. There's not much to it, but he just does stunts and gunk. So, you know, it's it's cool. It, it is what it is. From this point on, all of season two is mainly just Toy Story, but fish food. The rules regarding physics are nonsensical. Finn went from being able to effortlessly swim throughout the house to falling off the nightstand under his bed at the start of this arc. Gravity exists here as much as it doesn't. Extreme mentions Newton's laws at one point, even though every Everything here is telepathic. They're way more durable than actual goldfish crackers would be, and they have human senses as seen with them using the radiator like a sauna, and Gilbert complaining about a draft when a vacuum blows all the salt off of him, making him naked, and he complains to all of his naked friends right next to him. Speaking of which, the vacuum is by far the coolest villain in the series. I won't talk about him yet, but 
We'll get back to him. Don't don't you flip your flops. Under the bed in the in-universe world is like a melting pot of sorts. All flavors are shown here to an extent. Each of the main four comes from a different part of the house, which is also their known world. Fins from the nightstand. We've seen what that's like. I'm about to sound like an English teacher trying to put meaning into meaningless things, but Brooke comes from a snack bowl. And because all the fish were so close in the bowl, that's why she's so nice. Gilbert comes from a plastic bag. And that's why he's an uncharismatic, shallow freak who acts like he's been in a bubble his whole life because he has been. But extreme. He comes from the pantry. And the pantry is like a dictatorship state. And we find that out right after the season finale. The end of the season sees the fish preparing for a talent show. Brooke's talent is being smart. Finn can sing. Extreme's gonna be extreme. And Gilbert's gonna get rashes. Oh my god. God, there's actual people who act like this. In the final episode, Gilbert makes a funny scream. Everybody jokes about it until a comet crashes into the room, leaving a ton of flavored blasted debris. Okay. And that brings us to 2008, season three, the flavored blasted patriarch pantriarch. The giant comet crash came from Swimmington Von Stuffington III. He's the brother of Extreme, whose actual name is Dumbleton. And although both names are bad, Extreme is just a tad better. Apparently, Extreme lived into the pantry until he thought it was lame and cringe and dumb. So he does something cool, a little fish voice by Jimmy Neutron says, good job, and then he escapes. Now, immediately on Swimmington's arrival, he does two very important things. He says, hello, natives, and I've got more knots than a pretzel, trashing Gilbert within 10 seconds of meeting him and quickly becoming one of the best characters in the series. He's overall kind of a dick early on though, almost being like fish racist for no real reason other than these fish not being from the pantry. I also wanted to save this until now, but Gilbert's actually also like super awful, arguably worse than Swimmington at his worst moments. Like, like when he emphasizes how extreme is flavor blasted when introducing him, he's deathly afraid of square crackers compared to everyone else. To be fair, they treat them like ghost equivalents in this universe. He's insecure about his skin like trying to tan himself to look flavor blasted and then complains when brooke goes into the radiator sauna thing kind of freaking out when it becomes co-ed and then in the next commercial he kind of simps for brooke whatever bad thing a person is gilbert is at least like a quarter of that i get his name is a pun but the fact his name is gilbert should be a red flag for anyone luckily throughout the season swimmington actually improves as a person becoming more embracing of the ways of the bed and actually approving of extreme as a personish thing now but this finale has the craziest cliffhanger yet while playing on under the bed, the friends throw a frisbee far from everything. Remembering how Extreme collected a ball earlier in the season with a cool stunt, Gilbert decides to take a catapult out with Extreme to go retrieve it. In the middle of the expedition, the vacuum comes back, and for the only time in the series, Gilbert has a hype moment, pushing Extreme out of the way and saving him. And then it just ignores Extreme. I, that, that, that person's bad at vacuuming. 2009 filler episode. This is about the fish shooting a scene for the commercial. This is not canon. It's not real. It never happened. 2010. Season 4. Vacuum arc. 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 Yeah! This is the best one by far. It's peak fiction. And, 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 and to the actual, like, goldfish fan, it's like, it's not called vacuum arc. It's actually called the search for Gilbert. Sh shut up. Don't ruin this for me. This is, I want to call it what I want to call it, okay? This is my thing. Okay, let me have it. You little, you little... You little dummy head. Yeah. Although all the fish now have eyeballs instead of just some of them, although under the bed went from mostly the orange or colored ones to mostly the pink and green ones, and although the person using the vacuum is very bad at vacuuming and didn't even bother to check under the bed, it's right out in the open, and for years you've missed under the bed, you're, you're very stupid. This is still by far the best portion of Finn and Friends. I was hooked on vacuum arc when I was younger. For six months, I watched it in panic, waiting for something to happen. York New City, get that out of here. Cell Saga, I fell asleep halfway through saying that. Shouldn't exam? More like stupid an exam. In this season, we follow the other four members taking Brooke's paper airplane throughout the house to find Gilbert, meeting new groups of fish like that guy under the couch cushion and nobody else. Meanwhile, Gilbert tries to find a way out of the vacuum and meets IQ. He's not important, but he doesn't mind living as a vacuumarian. Gilbert eventually sends an SOS message by saying, Gee. The not Gilbert gang sees the message, covers themselves in paint to avoid the family dog. Gilbert uses the skills he learned from extreme stunts to make himself catapult out of the vacuum, and eventually they make it back where the vacuum is vacuuming again, and somehow the person using it doesn't see this giant crowd of fish, and also Gilbert gets kissed by a girlfish. 
who we don't know the name of, never have seen before this, and will never see again. Although this, although this arc had some flaws like anything does, I think it was pretty fun. We got to see the house, the quality improved, and Gilbert briefly got promoted from insufferable to tolerable. At this point, I might even like him more than Walter. But moving along to 2011 to 2013, we got season 5 the talent show arc. This is Coral. She came from the girls' room, and she's basically just Sandy from Spongebob Let a Fish. I don't, I don't, I don't know. And I know I said that Finn doesn't do that much after the first couple of seasons, but Coral actually doesn't do shit, like, ever. She does not contribute. She is, she does not matter in the slightest. Finn in the entire bed decides that they're gonna have another attempt at making a talent show after the first one. Kind of, kind of fell through after the comet thing from Swimmington. This is gonna be another arc about Gilbert, and Swimmington decides to be the mean guy and say that Gilbert has no talent, and that's it. That's, that, that's the only conflict for the next three years. Just Swimmington justifiably thinking that the pretzel is talentless. Right before the talent show starts, however, the hamster from the girls' room shows up in Oh no, oh no, the hamster, what are we gonna do? Fuzzy Face the hamster is a hamster. He's very important to the plot because he's not. He gets taken care of after 30 seconds. He's a bad antagonist and he sucks and this is the best conflict of the season, I'm serious. At this point, the season's already halfway over. I'm just gonna come out and say, it. wow, this bites my biceps. This is awful. How do you go from making the greatest season of all of entertainment to not really doing that? This is just so lame. It's like watching everyone except for Finn and Swimmington do talents. Extreme does a stunt, wow, I'm shocked. Brooke does a magic trick. Wait, actually, I'm I'm actually a bit shocked about that one. This one, Brooke, Brooke's tower was okay. I'll give her that. Gilbert sings and he levitates a mic. And you know what? It drains me to say it, but Gilbert wins. And his talent wasn't even good. I would say it's the worst one. It's just him going rock and roll, rock and roll. I'm singing a song like. Please, stop. You're giving me a migraine, just like how I'm giving you a migraine. And the worst part, Swimmington doesn't even do anything. He just congratulates Gilbert. And I'm sorry I doubted Walter, thinking that Gilbert might be better than him, but we all make mistakes and we learn from them. So hopefully the next arc is gonna be a bit better. And at least that finale at nighttime, it looked cool. Even though Jamie should have heard all of that noise while he was sleeping. Hey, wait a minute. How have none of the fish been seen by humans? Like, ever. They, 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 do, they, they don't even try in the slightest to hide. This world is stupid. Goldfish are stupid. 2013 to 2014, I think. I don't know the exact time points for anything, but I know it's chronological, but still, these are all guesstimates. Season 6, The Great Outdoors. This is the season that is mainly decided by viewers interacting with goldfishfun.com, where you can watch and play additional content from your favorite Pepperidge Farm product. They actually use this to choose the winner from the talent show, but just like this entire season, I don't think the viewer input actually mattered. But that talk is in another five minutes. The original four go outside, Swimmington sits this one out again, and Coral doesn't even show up. The gang is way out of their element here. Almost immediately they die to water, which, unlike regular fish, that's a no-no bad thing for goldfish crackers. They immediately get out and meet King Neptune, the ruler of Sandinavia, a kingdom that gets destroyed by the kid from Coral's room a mere 17.3 seconds after being introduced. And then they go turtle jousting, that a new castle is built, and none of them see it in this sandbox, even though, like, how did none of you see a new sandcastle being built? After that, they all go on a safari, then they go on a kitty cat where Gilbert does... that, and then they go back inside from the laundry monorail and give Swimmington an acorn beret. How absolutely bizarre and bonkers, and, and who... Whoa, whoa, whoa! This entire season feels like it's listening to a relative recite their entire vacation activities. Everything feels too nice, and there's like not, there's no issues anymore. It gets worse after this. 2015 to 2017, season seven, the camping arc. Coral's once again on the back burner, but this time she actually appears, so that's progress. The Friendship Brigade traveled to the distant land of four feet away from the bed. I really don't know what else they can add that would be that truly interesting or exciting. What? I lied earlier, this season isn't just the camping arc, but it's also, more importantly, a dream arc. This season has a three episode pattern that loops five times. The group will be doing some sort of camping activity, they go to sleep, and we see the dreams of one of the characters, and then they resolve whatever issue they've been having in their dream. These dreams truly give us a chance to learn about the characters and their deeper thoughts more than any previous moments in the series, and we can truly find out what these characters are like in their mind. Because of Jamie's snoring, Finn's dream is about being an astronaut, fighting an evil space emperor on a flying warthog that is defeated 
by the power of stickers. Do you remember when this was about goldfish trying not to be eaten? On the second day, the fish go fishing. And as a result, Brooke has a peaceful and wonderful dream about former president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, becoming vice president and needing help from Brooke, who is the actual president from a toddler kaiju by flying a pegasus to steer her out of Washington, D.C. This, 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 this entire, this is vacuum arc two. This is the only good part of the series after this. But what isn't that is what I have to talk about next. This is probably the best time to introduce it as well, but there was also several YouTube videos all about the goldfish titled When I Grow Up, and that raises a ton of questions, especially since the catalyst of all of their friendships was Finn moving out of the bag house, so I kind of imagine them being like in their goldfish 20s. Basically retconning the ages of every one of the goldfish children, I perceive them being like goldfish college students basically. The point is this is weird. These videos essentially are just seeing the characters talk about the jobs they want. Finn wants to play baseball, Brooke a veterinarian, and Gilbert a firefighter. A man can dream. Just like Extreme, he dreams about absolutely clapping former basketball professional Dwayne Wade in a 1v1 with a score of 60 to 0. This was surprisingly the easiest one to swallow. Gilbert's dream is about a talking fuzzy face voiced by Swimmington attempting to commit four acts of homicide through the use of safety scissors until Finn makes him cut that shit out. And then they all laugh about this traumatic situation. But of course, the dignified Swimmington has a dream about being the Monkey King. And all of his friends ask him to not do that. And they say please, and he abandons his dream monkey wife. If this doesn't make you want to eat goldfish crackers, I don't know what will. And with that exciting finale, we have finally reached the final finale. The finaliest finale. If you're wondering how exciting this exciting saga will have any exciting or close, well... Y you should probably sit down for this, unfortunately, unless you're already seated and then stand up and sit back down. Okay, I'm sorry, I'll move on. 2017 to 2021, the finalish seasons, note that it's plural, the pretty wasted wasteland arc. Okay, so technically I'm combining two seasons, but there's a reason for it. There's nothing. The ending to a series that ran for nearly two decades is watching a slow fizzle into nothing. If you remember goldfishfun.com, the site that let viewers decide what would happen, I think it was partially responsible for this decline in quality. Now entire episodes are dedicated to promoting mobile games and games found on the site. I couldn't gain access to any of the mobile games, but the online ones I found were pretty bland overall, not that much to them. They were, they were kind of buggy, they're not too unique. But to be fair, they didn't really have to be. It's a series of commercials, not a series of games. Though that doesn't excuse the one-faced Extreme makes in the isometric Pac-Man game. <laughs> the latter portion of these seasons follow the palace trying to make some movies with wacky antics ensuing every time, and it's... It, it's fine. It, you know, it's... it's not good, it's not bad. It's just right in the middle. They're hanging out, they're very occasionally showing a twinkly twinkle of what it used to be. What isn't there though is the rest of the fishy world. I loved how early on everything felt like it was more alive. But after the talent show arc, we kind of just stopped seeing all the background fish. It wasn't that noticeable in the great outdoors and camping stuff because we were hardly there. My guess is that in the middle of camping, the kid actually vacuumed correctly because there's still a lot of stuff under there, like a laptop, but maybe that's just for storage. The only interesting addition to the story, or how anything works, is everyone freaking out when Jamie puts a retainer in his mouth, implying that somehow Finn forgot that he spent an entire year of his life attempting to avoid fish being eaten like he literally has a goldfish brain in that case if he forgot watching fishy genocide i guess i should mention that walter is presumed dead too we see the nightstand but we never actually see the bag there so uh you know ri ri uh, rip 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 scooby doo may he rest his soul unfortunately that's where it ends without one Finn never really got the chance to be important once again after the first few seasons, Brooke was always kind of there, never fully getting a moment being debatably more of a foil than Finn was. Swimmington and Extreme actually kind of received closure with their relationship, but otherwise they didn't really need that much or have anything else. Uh, Coral. But Gilbert, even though I don't really like him, actually had a visible change in character over time. He genuinely became a better character and better in character. Don't get me wrong, he still had those points near the end where he was kind of annoying, but I think he was the only one who actually like had further development in the later seasons, kind of recognizing that his friends were there for him. So the worst part of the earlier seasons became the best part of the ending seasons. Unfortunately, that's it. If you look at more recent commercials, you'll see that there's like still commercials like the doy dum dum, that's business, businessy business brewing, why would they stop making commercials? But I don't know. 
The superhero robot chicken stuff was okay. If you ask me if I'd rather see Finn the Talking Fish or Bobin Majerinovic, Marginovic, I probably got that wrong. I would 99.6% of the time choose Finn the Talking Fish between the two of them. But from what it seems like, I'm not too sure we should expect anything from the future. I hope that someday we actually see where the story goes, if it can go anywhere. What else can be done? Where else can we see these tiny food pallets go to? What was the deal with the guy under the couch cushion? Is he still alive? I'm actually very interested about that. If you want to see more videos about Finn and friends, there's actually a few pre-existing funny fish videos, but I did actually avoid seeing them until saying this exact line in my script so I could come up with my own ideas and, and be able to make some of the stuff up because everything I say has a 1 in 10 chance of intentionally being a lie. And now, honestly, I would recommend you check them out. No, that was not a lie. And neither was me saying that was a lie. And neither was me. Well, it's been 19 and a half-ish minutes. Subscribe and join me next time when I become a master chef. Now I just gotta compare and contrast this delightful dish with my cookbook. Ah, damn it.